Every little thing that I own that I'm looking at right now in my apartment has an invisible hologram that says property of Mitch's recovery. The second I forget that is when I start get like diving into deep, like dark selfishness. Welcome to Positive Recovery MD. If you're listening, chances are you want to create happiness around you and thrive in your life. We're glad you're here and you've come to the right place. This podcast will inspire and motivate you to not merely survive your recovery journey. We'll give you the tools to build or strengthen your foundation to thrive and flourish in your life. In each episode, we will come together as a community to have authentic conversations around addiction, recovery, and what matters, growth and progress, not perfection, all while developing positive habits for you to utilize. To learn more, please visit positiverecovery.com forward slash podcasts to sign up and to receive the daily positive interventions that we'll review, as well as gain access to exclusive positive recovery content available only to Positive Recovery MD listeners. All right, let's get started. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another installment of Positive Recovery's MD podcast, Mm -hmm. where we talk about all things related to flourishing in life and flourishing in life in recovery. So we've got a special guest today, Mitch Leff, and I'm interested to hear more about you from you, but we have probably a, a connection through SoulCycle, which is great. So I'm, so when you get there, I'll, then I'll name drop. Yeah, so uh, I know you've written a book, My Superpower, My Addiction, My Superpower by Mitch Motivates. It's a good book. I, I like how... Uh, you give salient advice at the end of every chapter. feel like it's well-written. And anyway, welcome, dude. So tell us more about you and uh, your throughout your story. Like, what was it like? What happened? What is it like now type of thing? Thank you, Dr. Powers. I- is it okay if I call you Jason? I'm just, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share my story. So let me tell you about what I did today, because I'm a guy that practices what he preaches. Tomorrow's my 16th year anniversary sober. Mazel tov. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Thank you. And I have a home group that meets every Saturday, a men's meeting. And it's really an amazing group. I love this meeting. And next week, I'm not going to be there because I'm going to be with my family for Labor Day weekend. So I decided, because I have an amazing relationship with my family mm-hmm. today, I decided to celebrate today at the meeting that I chair and I show up to do service every Saturday. This is Over 18 years after I was introduced to AA, I still do service and give back, okay? So I was given a chip today at my 7.30 meeting. I was picked up and dropped off to the meeting by my sponsee, this guy, a newcomer that I met in Florida on a business trip, okay? Then I spent some time with my dog. I went food shopping earlier this week because I'm a responsible adult who has money in his pocket today. I have a dog and I take care of my dog and I put food in her bowl and I put food on my table. These are all things that were never possible before when I was using. I made myself lunch. I took my dog for a walk and we ate lunch in the park where I live in beautiful Greenwich, Connecticut. Now I'm talking to you, then I'm going to take a nap. And then later tonight, I'm going over to my girlfriend's house because she's going to cook me dinner to celebrate my anniversary together. Tomorrow, I'm going to meet up with my girlfriend and my best friend who's also sober, who I was with him when we met his wife together. I was at his wedding and I was there for the birth of his child. And us four are going to go see the Greenwich Polo players play polo. I've never been, but I'm trying something new. And I'm just, everything I do today, Jason, is opposite 180 of what I used to be like when I was using. So I practice what I would preach. It's a gift to be sober today, but it wasn't always like that. I grew up in North Jersey, great family, and everything was great except my relationship with alcohol and drugs. The first time I tried it, it was just me and a couple guys in a friend's basement. We, it was normal, except to me, it was different, dude. To me, it was like a warm apple pie on a summer day. To me, it was like the best thing I've ever had when I just had my first drink like that. Three guys in a basement, his parents are not home. And I took it to the extreme right away. Yeah. I started drinking alone. I started stealing alcohol. I started borrowing from anyone's house. I went to visit my cousins, my uncle. Any, I, just alcohol would just disappear. 
And I would replace, you know, and the the stupidest thing I ever did was my dad had vodka in the freezer and I took some out and replaced it with water. It froze. And he's like, Mitch, what is this? You know, but it, it got out of control pretty quickly. Soon I, I changed friends. Soon I was smoking weed. And, you know, I was a 16 year old kid. So sure. weed was easier to get than than alcohol. You know, my as my friend says, drug dealers don't cart. <laughs> my, you know, my addiction quickly progressed and into smoking weed every day from there i was smoking weed with multiple groups of people and i just got rid of all the friends i grew up with and i was on a pretty bad path i somehow skated by high school to graduate during that time towards the end of graduation i really had developed a bad cocaine habit um in high school i was doing cocaine during school i was doing it before school i one of the guys i would smoke weed with introduced me to cocaine and that really took me downhill quickly Graduation night from high school, I got arrested. Everyone was going out to celebrate. I was handcuffed to a chair. You know, my parents basically didn't know what to do with me. So when I went away to college in the state of Indiana, they were grateful that I was just getting because I was just causing so much trouble. But that was the worst thing for me. And pretty soon I hit my bottom. I was alone in Indiana. I didn't go to class and I had a really bad cocaine habit. I remember when I came back from my freshman year or from the winter break of my freshman year. The guys in my dorm did a mini intervention and they wanted to send me to rehab somewhere in the Midwest. Like it was crazy. I was living alone at the time at my bottom. My roommate had moved out because I was such a like mess. I didn't go to class. I didn't shower. I didn't bathe. I urinated in water bottles in my dorm room. I was, I didn't need to eat. I was just doing drugs and that was my life. How can I get more and how can I get money to get more? God intervened in my life and I was able to get sober because I ran away. I came back to New Jersey in April of my freshman year. I was just about to turn 19 and I ended up running away from home where my parents filed a missing persons report. Yeah. They f- they found me in some motel room and a week later I was in rehab. And that's when I first got sober. This was in 2006, Jason. So that's how I ended up. That That's my story to getting into sobriety. Do, would you like me to talk about my recovery and how I got to my yeah, book? Yeah, man, keep going. So basically, I am I turned 19 in rehab. To me, I really wanted to go. When my parents found me and I had like IVs in my arm and they took me to – cops showed up at the motel room, took me to the hospital. I realized pretty quickly I had a problem. <laughs> it was, you know, it was like I, – and I said I needed help. So I went away and I was away for rehab in rehab for four months. And now the first two years of my recovery were not perfect, but I'm a glass half full kind of guy. I think we really connect on that, just giving positivity towards our recovery, um, which I really like about you. But so the first two years of my recovery, it wasn't perfect, but I just kept on showing up and kept on moving forward. Right. And I just, you know, my, my brain wasn't cleared yet, but I had smart feet, I like to call it. So I just kept on putting one foot in front of the other. I kept on listening to the professionals. And despite a, a couple of relapses, I kept moving forward. So I went to rehab for four months. Then I went to a halfway house in the Poconos in Pennsylvania for four months. Then I went to live with people from that halfway house for about a year and a half, two different apartments, two sober dudes. Okay. Two different apart, like I just kept on listening. They said, live with the people and have sober roommates, have the sober community as your foundation. And even though I had relapsed at that point, I always had the safety net to come back to. I set myself up for success. I found out that Rutgers University had a program for students in recovery, and I transferred after a year and a half in Pennsylvania, going to community college and getting back on my feet. I transferred to Rutgers where I was for three and a half years. I was able to have a success there. You know, when I was at Indiana, I failed out of of college and got all Fs and went to rehab. When I was at Rutgers in sobriety, I made Dean's List. I played golf with my professors and I was able to get an internship in New York City. So I moved to New York. Here I am as a sober guy, you know, in New York, the recovery community in New York is amazing. So I knew I would have success there. Again, The foundation and putting my sobriety first was always the thing I did. I got really into 12-step. I started working in the field of recovery for a recovery company where we specialize in gender-specific sober living. So my whole life was recovery. And I was like militant about my 12-step program, my job, and that 
was what I focused on for the first like five years of my recovery. That was my life. Mm. But but what I what I did pretty quickly is I started to adventure out and it rate and that's you know we talked about Soul Cycle earlier. I I started my whole life was recovery and I started to at that point for like five six years into getting sober really start to branch out. That's when I felt comfortable because I had the solid foundation. And I started, I call them sober adjacent friends. I would go to Soul Cycle all the time and would see the same people. And while they weren't in recovery, they liked a healthy lifestyle. They were into fitness. They were into health. And like we connected on that. So I, it was the really the first time in my adult life I had non sober friends yeah. through the fitness community in New York City. So I was working in recovery, but I started to branch out. I started to listen to podcasts and I started to find mentors, people like Gary V or Barbara Corcoran. And I really started to develop this brand, which now I call Mitch Motivates, which is basically like, basically Mitch Motivates is me openly through, you know, positivity, through honesty and through vulnerability, telling about, telling my story and sharing my journey. That's what led me to wrote, write my book, My Addiction, My Superpower, because I wanted to share my story with the world. I got really into podcasts and reading during the pandemic when we were on lockdown. Yeah. And at that point, I, w- I was in, in recovery for so long that I thought that I had a great story that I had to share with the world. At that point, I was working for a private medical practice in for a plastic surgeon in New York City. And it it was the first time that I had not worked in recovery in 10 years. And I really missed the recovery piece. I missed it. So I I took on this project to write the book and that was just great. And I, even in the book, I share about how I wrote it because I believe in sharing my story, honestly, open, uh, you know, with honesty, openness, with kindness and with vulnerability. Like I, I share how I did everything in my life. And I think that's inspiring, Jason. So it really leads us to where we are today because I am, I, I love doing podcasts and I love sharing my story. I wrote the book, obviously, and I liked, and I did, I, I'm always on like a book tour. I'm always doing book signings and getting the word out there, sending the book out to people, speaking at rehabs. And it's, it's not really a money thing. It's really just a way to spread. Like I'm not, it's, I'm not trying to make money off the book. I'm trying to spread the message and share my experience, strength and hope. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of how we connected. Like what I did is I wrote my story down in each chapter at each point in my life. I, sh- I summed it up with a tip and uh, some advice for people who want, who were interested in staying sober themselves in overcoming addiction. Yeah. I love, I love that part of it, especially the sober adjacent friends or, you know, finding a, a like a sober adjunct kind of like soul cycle. And one of my mentors was George Valiant, who's a, a professor at at Harvard, and he was on the the board of AA because he's not an alcoholic. I think they they wisely exclude us, but he um, he's now passed. But he was a prolific author, and he wrote about finding a substitute. Like he's like that, you know one of, one of the things you need you need love, you need other people, and you need a meaningful substitute. And this was this was from studying like the 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 biggest longevity study ever is that Harvard study. Where there was like a Kennedy in there, and and you know, so like a wide demographic, but following somebody from birth to death gives you insight, like large numbers, like that study gives you insight into, you know, health trends. And there was a lot of them who are alcoholic, and the ones that got better went to AA. Figure it. Yeah. Yeah. So I like how you say uh, sober, like an adjunct or, or like kind of like a meaningful substitute. Now Soul Cycle. I don't know if you ever ran into while you were in New York. And Amy Peck. I mean, the name sounds familiar. The, the name sounds familiar. I don't know who that oh, okay. is. Nice who, tell me who she is. And she she joined Soul Cycle when it was one studio, a hole in the wall, and then like worked her way up to where she was like the head of training or HR. Or I don't know what she did, but she was like, wow. yeah. And she did it a lot. Like every time I went to New York, it, it was the greatest gift. Is like we would do Soul Cycle together, and yeah. and I thought when she she was like. Um, she was with Condé Nast magazine for years and worked her way up and was like given a kingdom, but then left that to go when Soul Cycle was one studio. And I told her that's the dumbest business idea I've ever heard of just spinning because they didn't do it yet. And obviously, <laughs> I know what I'm talking yeah. about. <laughs> so, 
You didn't listen to me, but uh, and uh, so darn, I thought maybe you knew her. Well, I mean, it's a small world. I'll that's. I mean, that's a coincidence. That's great. She still works there. No, no, no. Uh, when they sold, she she got a parachute out of there too. Got it. No, she's great, and she's working with peoplehood. And hey, Amy, if, in case this makes a cut, love you. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. So her son just had a bar mitzvah in the Catskills. Yeah, at can, at Auto Camp. So my sister like schlepped a rabbi from New York. It was like the most beautiful thing I'd ever been to. It was so meaningful. That's cool. And I was able to show up, unlike the way I used to show up, which is how you showed up for one of your niece's bat mitzvahs, which I love. Yeah. Look, I show up today and that's something I'm super proud of because I was unable to do it before. You know, that's why at the beginning I wanted to tell you exactly what I did today because I'm unable I think that people need to know that it's possible. And that's everything I do is it's like hard for me cuz I don't it doesn't exist that much. People that just honestly share what they're doing. You know, I take them the line from the movie Philadelphia when Denzel Washington says, "Tell it to me like I'm a 6-year-old." I had no idea, you know, I don't know how to go to 90 meetings in 90 days unless you explained it to me exactly how to do it, you know? I don't know how to have a a job and be successful unless you explained it to me how to do it, you know? And that's what I like to do with my recovery and everything I'm doing today. I love how you use that storytelling technique, which is you explained what you did, but you gave the why, like it was the best possible explanation of why you work mm-hmm. and that you're able to provide for you and your, and your loved one, you know, your animal. And uh, just, it's great because like we do things for meaning. We do things for the why. And you, you like juxtaposed not only what you're doing now, but like how meaningful it is. And those are gifts of recovery to how you started out, which obviously it's like peeing in a bottle in your dorm room and not bathing or eating is, uh, mm-hmm. I can relate to that, sadly. It is such a desperate place. Like, it's not fun. It's so desperate. Yeah, I mean, look, I I had a buddy that used to say, and I think this is true for me, every little thing that I own that I'm looking at right now in my apartment has an invisible invisible hologram that says, property of Mitch's recovery. Mm. Mm. And I, I can never forget that. The second I forget that is when I start get like diving into deep, like dark selfishness. Yeah. And then because I really believe that, you know, my alcoholism then takes over and then it's never, en- when I get in that selfish mode, it is never enough. Yeah. The, ge- the, the real gift about being sober and this life of recovery is that to be grateful, but like to actually like to like feel grateful with everything you have in the for today in the moment that is the gift of recovery that takes a lot of practice to, and and I'm telling you if I'm not firing on all cylinders I like I go down a dark hole even today even almost even 16 years of continuous sobriety in tomorrow it is it requires like our wholehearted attention because what creeps back into our like limited attention bandwidth. One one of the guests on the podcast said it perfectly yesterday. It's like it's like a maniac mind, right? So we need to be on guard against it. Like there's no holidays. There's no like, okay, I could take it easy. I can go on autopilot for a lot of us. Yes. And as I'm thinking, it the you know, the worst part about this disease is that it's cunning, baffling, and powerful, and it like just sneaks up on you if you're not doing the right thing. Yep. You know, and to to me, how it looks like is looks like is it starts like the week before. I'm like over planning my schedule, so then not getting enough sleep. Then I'm let's say I'm missing like my prayer in the morning. Then like a couple days later, I'm like irritable and I'm getting in trouble at work because like I don't have patience with like one of my coworkers and I'll yell at her and then I'll get in trouble with my boss. And then I'll feel I'll have to overcompensate and work harder. And then I'll miss something that I said I would show up for. It, it's like it's a snowball. And I 
I have enough sober experience and sober reference today that like I can see that from a mile away. So that's what I mean when it's cunning, baffling, and powerful. Like in one moment, I'll be, I, I won't plan my week appropriately and I'll over plan. And two weeks later, I'm like missing um, a dinner and with friends because I'm like, it, it, it's crazy. And I could see that now. So do you think that at least to some degree, you've kind of reset your default mode that you can see that now? a mile away and you prevent it. But like early in recovery and certainly before you couldn't, you were in the weeds before you recognized it. So maybe yeah, you've rewired your brain a little is all that you're feeling. You're experiencing that. I would a hundred percent agree. And that comes with militant discipline. Yeah. And for me, I'm not that smart, Jason. It took me 10 years to, to get this down. Like, yeah, you know, it t- what other people could do in a couple of years. It took me a decade, um, but that's just my path. And I, I think one of my strengths is that I have, I can overcome failure and keep moving forward because it's how I got through my relapses, and it, it's how I've got through jobs, relationships, and I just I keep on trying different ideas, different things, and the answer is just very simple. And it's like a couple things I need to do every day and I need to be consistent. And that's the answer for me. I love it. I mean, the ability to enjoy life's simplicity for me is a gift of recovery. I don't need all my moments adorned anymore, if that makes sense. So like I'm happy eating, for example, like bread and cheese. I'm super happy with that versus, you know, needing to have, I don't know if that's the best example. I don't know if it resonates with anybody, but like, yeah, you know, like, like hanging out with people who I respect, that to me is a greater joy than being seen in the right place with the right person. So I'm grateful for that. A thousand percent. Yeah. Because it's all ego, Jason. That's what that is, yeah. ego. I can relate. I, I love jewelry and I have a couple nice watches, but lately I've been I've kept them locked in my safe, like and I wear this Timex everywhere. <laughs> and um I wear this Timex everywhere and that's where there's freedom in being able to walk down the street and like just not care about, you know, I feel like we'll we'll talk about soul cycle for a minute. People wear jewelry to soul cycle to show off. Like I don't understand the point of wearing jewelry when you work out. It doesn't make sense. But if you have a bunch of bracelets and watches on while you're in a workout class, you're doing it so other people can see. Right. So, For me, like when I'm doing the right thing and I'm on the beam and I'm like, I call it firing at all cylinders, but when I'm just spiritually on the beam, I'm so, I'm so happy in my Timex rather than my Rolex. Seriously, because I have a a problem where I, if I wear a nice watch, I need people to look at it (laughs) and that's not, that's not healthy. So I can identify with the bread and cheese because that's what I was saying earlier, like it, I'm a different person today because I'm sober. And as a result, like before I was using, I did it. I wasn't eating, you know, or, you know, where I had to, now I go grocery shopping and plan my week and make sandwiches and go to the park with my dog and eat it. That's what I did today. And there was bread and cheese in that. So I get it. Good day. And it's a gift of sobriety. I just, I'm, I'm so happy and I'm sober and that's what it's all about. Right. Yeah. So like, I'm in. If anything, like my message is if you work hard, like you can stay sober and be happy. And I think that's important to share as many people as possible talk about being sober and happy. I couldn't agree more. And I think that's like a perfect place to end. Absolutely. Thank you, Mitch. Thanks for joining us. I know our listeners are going to uh, really dig your, your message as much as I have. And if anybody wants to get in contact with you, how would they do that? Thank you, Jason. I keep it simple. Mitch Motivates at Mitch Motivates at social media, MitchMotivates.com or email me Mitch at MitchMotivates.com. We keep it as simple as possible. And if you want to find my book, it's on Amazon, My Addiction, My Superpower. Thanks, Mitch. And thank you guys for joining us. Until next time, be good to yourselves and others. This is not a dress rehearsal. Thank you for listening to this episode of Positive Recovery MD. Don't forget to visit PositiveRecovery.com forward slash podcast to sign up to get your daily positive interventions sent straight to your inbox. 
Be sure to subscribe to Positive Recovery MD on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts to receive an automatic download when a new episode drops. And as always, if you or someone you know needs help, visit PositiveRecovery.com or call 877-4-SOBRIETY. That's 877-476-2743. Our why is simple. We care. We are here to help.